Um, but it is noon, so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Kayla Clark, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator for UGA Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant. So as an organization, we contribute to healthy coastal ecosystems and economies through research, education, and outreach. Um, and oysters are super important to our healthy coastal habitats. So I'm excited for you to get to talk more with Dodie Sanders about this really incredible species. Uh, but before we get started, a couple of tips for using Zoom. You will notice that your video and your microphone are turned off. Uh, we do still wanna hear from you. So if you have comments, you can share those at any time through the chat box. And again, if you just joined, you can find that by hovering at the bottom or the top of your screen, uh, depending on your device. Look for the word chat and then go ahead and click on that. Um, if you have questions, you can answer them in the Q&A box. Um, and so that's also on the toolbar at the top or bottom. Can't find the Q&A box, no worries. You can uh, put your questions in the chat and we'll grab them from there as well throughout. Um, and so with that, we are gonna go ahead and get started and I'm gonna turn it over to Dodie. Thank you, Kayla. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for, for joining us today. We're really excited, as Kayla mentioned, for you to join us with our Oyster Reef uh, communities. And I'm gonna ask uh, Kayla to just go ahead and spotlight me and we'll get started. And I'd like to start off by asking the simple question, because I don't know what you know about oysters, is what is it that you already know about oysters? And as Kayla mentioned, you can put things into the chat box. So go ahead and, and put some of your responses into the chat box. What is it that you know about oysters? And while we're doing that, I'll kind of lay out a plan. I'll talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing. So we're going to start with sort of the, the morphology, the external features of of an oyster, we'll take a close look at that. And then we'll segue into the internal part. We'll take a peek at the inside of an oyster. Um, I thought folks might be interested in learning a little bit about the inside parts, especially for those of you that like to eat oysters, um, you wanna know what you're eating. And then perhaps we'll, we'll take a few minutes and we'll, we'll talk about the ecosystem services of oysters. Why is it that they're so important? And then the culminating activity is that Kayla and I have several species of organisms that are encountered in, on, and around oyster reefs. So that's kind of the, the layout of the plan. Um, hopefully you guys will learn something. Um, hopefully I learned something from you as well. So Kayla, is there anything that um, people have come up with in terms of what they know about oysters? Yes, so actually folks have put a number of things in the chat box. Um, some people said they only move during the first parts of their life. They are part of the bivalve family. They can be from clusters. They eat using a filter system. Uh, they taste great. Uh, they build up in communities, filter water and clean it up. Um, someone observed that their shells are very sharp, uh, that they taste different depending upon where they grow. Awesome. Wow, those are a lot of good, that, those are a lot of good responses. Great. Um, but we're going to start with the, the external features. Um, someone mentioned that they have valves. This is a bivalve, a hard um, exo or a hard shell made of calcium carbonate. And if we look at the external features of an oyster, um, I'm just going to point out some of the parts. This is actually the oldest part of the oyster. This is called the umbo. Okay, and as that oyster grows, it deposits that calcium carbonate shell. So this would be the younger part of the oyster. That's sometimes called the beak or the bill. Most often it's called the beak. So we've got the umbo and then we've got the beak. And scientists um, usually measure oysters when they're looking at sort of determining the growth of oysters over time. They'll use something as simple as this. This is just a, a caliper that they'll use to measure the oyster. And the measurements that they're really interested in, in obtaining are this. From the umbo to the, to the beak or the bill, we'll, we'll call it the, the beak, the umbo to the beak, that's the height of the oyster. If we were to go across section here, in the widest part, that's actually the length of the oyster. And then if we were to put the valves together, okay, two valves together, the thickness of this oyster shell would be the width. Okay, so we've got, we've got the height, the length, and then the thickness, so the width. So as I mentioned, this is a this is a bivalve related to mussels, related to clams, and it's that calcium carbonate exoskeleton. If we look at oysters, if we um, 
take a look at a, a, an oyster. Again, the shell morphology varies depending upon a lot of different environmental factors. It could depend upon the salinity, the temperature, um, the velocity of the currents, the amount of sediment. And you'll notice that this oyster shell, when we look at an oyster, there's usually a deep cup, that's the left valve, and then there's a flatter valve, the right valve, it almost kind of compares it to a plate and a bowl. And the bowl part, of that's where the meat, that's where the animal um, resides. So we have an upper or right valve and then a lower left valve. If we look at the inside of that oyster, we take a look quickly at the inside of that oyster, there's actually some markings that we, we kind of pay attention to. Does anybody know what this mark is? What that's from or, or does anybody know the name of that? Jody, I'll give folks just a minute to add that to the chat box. Okay. In the meantime, we did have a comment from one of our participants that say that, um, that they're having a little bit of a hard time hearing your audio. Okay. Um, so I'm wondering if we want to take it off automatic. All right, um, I'll check that and, out. And then while you're doing that, we had a couple more observations. Um, some people added that seagulls love eating oysters and then specifically about the question you just asked, a few people said the muscle attachment point or where the muscle is connected. Someone else added perhaps mother of pearl. Oh, those are good answers. Well, um, and I went ahead and, and took the audio off. So hopefully that, that makes it better for people to, to hear. Um, this is actually the result of the, the adductor muscle. There's a muscle in the oyster that the oyster uses to close its shell. So when the oyster is, is using that muscle, the oyster is closed. When it relaxes, then that, that causes that oyster shell to kind of gape open. And that's when they feed. And if it's low tide, um, what they'll do is they'll close that excess or they'll close those two valves up to, to avoid desiccation. So that's actually where the adductor muscle attached to the shell. Now you'll notice that, you know, different oyster shells take on different shapes and sizes. Again, it's because of those environmental factors. But if you look at the shape of the adductor muscle, in part, that really um, resembles the shape of the oyster. So those oysters that are single on firm bottoms um, tend to grow more round, they're more robust, kind of like the Chesapeake Bay oyster or the, the oysters from the Gulf. Whereas if you look at the oysters that we get here locally, wild caught oysters, they tend to be long and narrow. And if you look at that adductor muscle scar, then that in part again takes on the shape of the shell. It's long and narrow, just like the, the shell. All right. Ready? Yes. So sorry to interrupt, um, okay. but we, we are getting some comments back that for at least several people that, that made the audio worse. So I'm sorry to make you flip flop with the audio, but I think if we can go back to the setting that you had um, and then folks at home, if you can try raising your audio volume and we'll see if that, that helps. Thanks for hanging with us as we navigate the technology. Sounds good. It's live TV, right? <laughs> All right, so if we're gonna move on then from the sort of the, the um, external, Feature. So I, I thought maybe folks would be interested in looking um, at the internal part. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch cameras and we're going to talk about um, the internal parts of an oyster. So an oyster, when we, when we think about an, an oyster, um, it's a filter feeder. And someone mentioned that, I think, originally in the chat box. And a filter feeder draws in water. And when it draws in water, it's going to be drawing in basic components that are in the water, anything from sediment to dissolved oxygen to the food that it needs in order to, to live, like plankton. And so it's a process of, of determining what that oyster is going to want to ingest. And so when we look at the oyster, the internal parts, and I've got a pointer here, I'm going to point it out. Um, I'm going to point a few structures or a few organs out, and then what we're going to do is we're going to kind of mimic how an oyster filters and how it feeds and what structures or what organs are involved in, in that process. So we already talked about the mantle. Okay, that's that fibrous mantle, um, and not the mantle, excuse me, the adductor muscle, and that's the muscle that's responsible for helping the oyster keep the oyster closed. 
right? So when I shut this oyster not too long ago, some of that fibrous material was still left behind. You also see here some remnants of what we call the mantle. And the mantle is the, is the structure that's responsible for secreting that calcium carbonate shell. The mantle is not necessarily attached to the valves. The upper valve has uh, one side of the mantle and then there's another mantle on the, the upper valve. So each valve has that thin layer called the mantle. And you'll notice here on the very end, so you see little tentacles, little dark, little dark hairs or cilia, and those are really for sensory. Okay, so the mantle again is responsible for um, secreting that 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 bivalve, that that shell, that calcium carbonate shell. The other thing I want to point out too, so we've got the mantle, and then we've got. Um, a heart. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to move to a, a more closer view. It takes a few minutes for it to focus. And what I what I've done is I've, I've again I've shucked another oyster. And what's really cool is that the heart is in the center. Okay, so if you look at the center of the image, you may see this thin, uh, pinkish, elongated structure, and it it beats every once in a while, and that's actually the heart. So I'm gonna to point to it just real quickly, right there. So let's just watch it for a minute and see if it starts to beat. Um, an oyster has a, a very different um, circulatory system. It's an open circulatory system. There's no arteries, um, no, no um, large veins to carry the blood throughout the organs. It's basically, oh, there it goes. Okay, so if you watch it, as I'm talking, you can watch it beat a little bit and, and it'll beat once you shuck an oyster, it can, well, it depends on how rigorously you shuck the oyster, it can beat you know, for minutes to, to hours at a, at a time. Um, but getting back to that open circulatory system, the, the oyster, um, like other mollusks, they have a hemolip. It's, it's, it's the type of, of blood, it's, it's blood, but it's it kind of, well, heme means blood, lymph means liquid. And so that blood is kind of carried through um, cavities. The heart is three chambers, um, but as I mentioned, it, it's kind of beating a little bit. Again, it'll it'll beat for a number of a number of minutes or a number of, of hours. So that's kind of cool to look at. Okay. Well, what I'd like to do now is go back to that um, dissection part, and we'll focus on the parts of the oyster involved in in the filtering process. Again, when we think about an oyster, it's a filter feeder. So it's gonna need the dissolved oxygen in the water, it's gonna need the plankton. And we can think about the oyster having a couple different chambers, open chambers. And so this is sort of the in current, this is where the water is drawn in. And the X current chamber is on the other side. Here's where that adductor muscle scar is. And interestingly enough, as that, as that oyster grows, this is the oldest part, this is the youngest part, this is the umbo. As that oyster grows, that muscle migrates down and it deposits, um, the, the, the ductor muscle is made up of, of muscle fibers. And so it kind of migrates as the, that shell grows. So let's look at, so we've got the in current chamber, we've got the X current chamber. Um, you'll notice here, we've got the mantle, again, that thin tissue that's responsible for the, the secretion of the, of the shell. And if we pull that kind of apart, remember we have one on both sides. So there's the lower, lower one. But one of the things I wanna point out is, is sort of that filtration process. So as water is drawn into the, into the chamber, the gills, okay, the gills are responsible for respiration. Okay, that's that gas exchange, the dissolved oxygen but it's also involved in food acquisition and sorting. So it's, gonna, it's responsible for sorting of the food materials that the oyster wants. The gills also serve as, they're, they're important in reproduction as, as well. So when the female releases the eggs, they're in a large mass, but the gills are able to sort of separate those individual eggs and, and when it's, the eggs are released, they're, they're in single form versus in mass. And that just allows fertilization to take, to take place much, much easier. 
So as the water is drawn into that incurrent, incurrent sort of area, the gills, there are actually four folds of gills. So here are the gills. I'm kind of pulling them aside. And again, there are four folds. So lots of surface area for that gas exchange to occur. But also as that, is, as that water is drawn in, of course, it's interested in the plankton. That's what it eats. And so the gills act as sort of a sorting. So there's cilia and there's a mucus. So as the, the, the oyster filters the water, the planters are the food that it wants, including the sediment, because again, the oyster can't separate the nutrients and the sediments and the trace elements all at one time and the sediment. So the gills function as sort of that uh, sorting process. So the materials are moved up the gills. And when it gets to about this point, then the oyster is going to eliminate some of the material that it doesn't want. And most often that's the sediment. Because of course the oyster doesn't want to ingest a lot of the sediment that just bogs it down. Um, it's, there's no nutritional value in that. Now, does an oyster ingest some of the sediment? Sure, some of the smart, smaller particles, some of the detritus matter. Um, but for the lar most part, they, they want to just eviscerate that, that sediment. So when it gets to this point, an oyster will actually blow out of its shell what we call pseudo feces. It's the false feces. And so it's mostly this matrix of sediment and um, things that it doesn't want. The gills then continue to move that um, material, the plankton, up towards the mouth. And the mouth is located here. The mouth is really hard to see. It's very small. But one of the things that we do see at the base of the mouth are these structures called palps. And I'm going to try to, to flip these palps. They're triangular. So at the base, so there's the very tip of one. Okay, there are a couple of the, the palps, and I'm going to move one and move the other. So the triangular part, that's the part that sort of sweeps the, gill, the, the, the gills, and it sweeps the gills to move that plankton material into the mouth. Okay, when it's the base of those palps actually um, are attached to the mouth, so it, it kind of Almost as like, does an oyster have lips or a mustache? Kind of. <laughs> so it sweeps, it sweeps those gills. The gills, okay, are responsible for that. The material then goes into the mouth. And again, we can't really see that. And it gets digested. This part right here, which I'm going to kind of open up a little bit with my probe so you can see, it has an intestine. Um, it also has a stomach. And this is actually is where the gonads are located too when it's spawning season that they're pretty prevalent. So I'm going to kind of push back this one mantle part and we're going to open up the stomach. And you can see the stomach inside the dark, the dark material. Okay, and that's just kind of digested material. That plankton is what they're interested in. And so that material gets moved down and to just to the left of the adductor muscle, and I couldn't find it earlier, but this is where the rectum and the anus would be. Okay, so what happens is that material gets digested. Um, there's actually part of, oh, there we go. I'm gonna open that up. That's the pericardial cavity. And right there is the heart. You can see the little tip of the heart. But that material then goes from the, from the rectum to the anus and gets blown out to this side. Um, as feces. And I've got a, actually, I've got a small clip, a small video clip that I'd like to show you guys in a few minutes that you can, you're able to see that. So again, those are really just the simple parts or internal structures of, a, of an oyster. Um, I want you to remember that the next time you eat a raw oyster, what you're exactly you're eating. Um, so Kayla, what we can do is we're going to shift um, back to the, to the PowerPoint I'm going to go ahead and go back to my camera and share screen. And we're going to go back to the, the PowerPoint. But at this point, is there anybody that has any questions about the internal or the external parts of an oyster? If you want to quickly put a couple of questions in the chat box, and I think we've got time, Kayla, to field one or two. Patty, we did have a question that came while you were doing the dissection. Okay. Um, someone was wondering, what color is oyster blood? 
Oh, that's a good question. Because, you know, there are some organisms like horseshoe crabs that actually have a copper based blood. Um, I, I would I would tend to say that it's it's sort of the, the reddish clear red blood, but not blue like a horseshoe crab that has a copper based um, blood. That's a very good question. Again, it's an open circulatory system. So a lot of the interstitial cell fluids mix with that. And it looks like we have the start of a question coming in. Oh, here we go. Um, do oysters have stomach acid? Yeah, they have, they do have some, they have a structure called a crystalline style that actually helps kind of grind out and macerate the, the, um, the food products or the food source. It's called a crystalline style. Very cool. And so we do have a couple more questions. Do we have time for them now or do you want me to save them for a little bit later? We can take one more question. I think we're good. Um, so someone asked, what is the little spray you see shooting up out of the shell? When I was doing the dissection? Yes. Okay, that's just, um, that's just water. Um, when you shuck an oyster, of course, a lot of that water is still maintained in those two valves. And so you tend to get a lot of that. They sometimes call it the oyster liquor. It's just the, the, um, the liquid part. Good questions, very good questions. All right, if, if we're good with that, keep the questions coming. As Kayla mentioned, you can put them in the, in the chat box, but I'd like to kind of go ahead and, and get started in talking about, um, I'm talking about oysters here along the coast. And so when we, when we consider where we find oysters, we find oysters here along the coast of Georgia intertidally. And when we, when we, Kind of dissect that term intertidal. Inter means between, tidal means obviously tides. So the oysters live between the tides. So at, at low tide that you see here in this little video clip, the oysters are exposed. Okay, they're, they're exposed to the elements, but that's okay because those two valves are able to, to tightly close without a ductum muscle and avoid desiccation. When the tide comes in, of course, those oysters are covered. And we sometimes refer to that as subtidal. Here along the coast of Georgia, they're predominantly intertidal. You may get patches subtidally. Um, up the Chesapeake Bay, they're subtidal. So they're under the water all the time. So what I'd like to do is, is talk a little bit about the, um, the life cycle. Because I, I find that the life cycle is really interesting. Um, it's, it's a very unique organism. But what happens, I go ahead and put my laser on, and what I think I have two lasers on there, but um, what happens is when the water temperature heats up, temperature is a cue, one of the cues that tells an oyster to spawn. And it tells the oyster to release its sperm and egg. Um, there are male oysters and there are female oysters. Um, interestingly enough, they're protandrous, what we call protandrous, and that means that oysters tend to start out as males, and as they mature, they shift over to females. And that makes sense because, of course, as they get larger, then females are able to produce, it takes a lot more energy to produce the eggs. So when the water temperature gets to be about 68 degrees, and that's generally in late May, mid to late May here in, in Georgia, that cue tells the um, the oysters to release the eggs and sperm. Are you guys seeing a double laser or is that just me? <laughs> All right, well- anyway. I think we're only seeing one on our end. Okay, cool. So I'm, I'm seeing two, but anyway, that's okay. So the, the eggs and the sperm are released. And interestingly enough, as a filter feeder, what happens is if the sperm is filtered into another adult oyster, that also cues them to, to to spawn, to release their sperm or release their eggs. And then once those sperm and eggs are released into the water column, and that's the amazing part is that they're released outside, then that fertilizes the egg. And that can happen over the course of um, minutes to hours. That fertilized egg then metamorphoses into what we call a trophophore larvae. And that becomes part of the plankton. It drifts and it wanders. And then, of course, it metamorphoses into what we call a veliger larvae. And that has cilia here. It's, it's still part of that, that plankton. Um, well, actually, it's, it's starting to metamorphose a little bit more into a benthic existence. 
And that last stage is what we call a pedibelager. And pedi means foot. This is the only time that that oyster grows a foot. And that foot is very instrumental in having or helping that oyster to find a hard substrate. So oysters need a hard substrate in order to settle, attach, and grow. And that foot is instrumental. It has what we call a, a bissel or bisel gland. And that gland is responsible for producing bissel or bisel threads. Muscles have them. That's what muscles use to attach to the substrate as well. But those bissel threads are only used for a very short period of time. The foot will ex extract um, the bissel threads and those bissel, bissel threads are used to attach to the hard surface so that that pedibelager doesn't wash away with the current. And they're only there for a short period of time before that gland then secretes a cement that permanently cements that oyster to a substrate, whether it be another oyster, um, a, a dock piling, a shell, another shell, whatever. Once that oyster settles onto a hard substrate, it can no longer, it can no longer move. Okay? And we refer to that as a juvenile oyster spat when it recently settles. So this pedibelager is really that transition between a planktonic existence and a more benthic existence. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna, I've got some video clips here of actually, um, this is the, the top one, the red one is, is a fertilized egg. And again, that, that takes minutes to hours. The second video, the video in the middle, that's the villager. And you can see the cilia to the right. Um, there's a lot of organic detritus in this particular sample, but you can also see the very small dots. That's plankton that we actually fed the villager larvae and it's actively feeding. And then this is really cool. I like this one the best. This is at the point at which that head of Melager produces that foot. And you can see the foot on the top of it. And it's just feeling around, trying to find a suitable substrate. So how long that takes, it could take, you know, it could take minutes, it could take hours. It really depends upon um, temperature and salinity and the, the substrate um, itself. So that's kind of the life cycle in terms of, well, how long does it take for it to go from fertilized egg to that juvenile spat to that settling? It takes um, at least two weeks for that whole life cycle process to take part. So I don't know if any of you know how to tell the difference between a male and a female um, oyster. There's only a, a couple ways. Um, one way is that do exactly what we did this morning, and that's that's dissect the oyster to look at the gonads. The second way is you can tell an oyster based upon how they release their eggs and sperm. So for a female, it's going to actually release its, its eggs in claps. It's going to open up that valve, and you're going to see a puff. It looks like smoke, but that's actually a puff of eggs, and that's at the very top. A male is a little bit different. Um, the male, you can actually see a steady stream. Is my laser, Kayla, on the left side of that male oyster? It is. Okay, good. So you can, I want you to watch in this area. So the male releases its sperm very differently. Instead of a clap like a female, it's going to release that, that um, sperm in a steady stream. So let's go ahead and take, I'm going to probably play it a couple times, but I want you to, for the female, Again, watch the very top and you'll see sort of a puff. It looks like a puff of smoke. Those are actually eggs that she's releasing. So keep watching. Here we go. I'm going to try it real, going to try it quickly again. So watch it again, that puff. That's how they release the eggs. Cool. Okay. Now the male, again, look to that left side. And I'm going to go ahead and play it a couple times, but it's pretty much a steady stream of sperm. So that's one way that you can tell the difference if they're spawning between male and female. Otherwise, you're going to have to, to, to dissect, um, dissect the oyster. Cool. All right. Well, what is it that the oyster likes to eat? Okay, this is actually a culture that we have at our hatchery. It's called tetraspelmus, and it's a flagellated, um, it, it's, wrong way, it's a um, flagellated planter. And you're going to notice that it has little flagella. And even though plankton drift and wander, they're pretty much at the mercy of the currents, um, 
they have these little flagella that can move, move around um, that help them kind of twirl around in, in the water. Um, the size is about 10 microns. And when we think about, well, what size of food does an oyster like to eat? It's generally between 10, sometimes 20, 30 microns in size. But again, this is just one example of the, of the many species of planters that the, the oyster will eat. So predators of the oyster. Lots of different predators that feed on the oyster. And this is just a, an example. This is not an all-inclusive list. These are just some of the examples, but we've got crabs that live on and around the oyster reef that when they're small, like the, the, the oysters are small spat, their powerful claws are able to break them up. Same thing with a blue crab. Okay, blue crab has powerful, powerful claws. Um, we've got a moon snail, an oyster toadfish, and then cow nose rays. Does anybody know what this particular species? This is related to, to oysters. It's a, it's a gastropod, but does anybody know what this predator is? Taylor, are we getting any responses? Does anybody know what that is? Um, we've got two, two guesses for oyster drill and another one for whelk. Okay, good. Well, it's, it's related to whelks. It, it is an oyster drill. And an oyster drill has a, a, a special structure that it actually does drill into the shell. Again, they're not going to go take the really thick, mature oysters because that exoskeleton, or not, not that exoskeleton, but that shell is really thick, so it'd be hard to drill through. They're going to take the smaller juvenile oysters. But yeah, so these are just some examples of, of different um, predators of the oyster. All right, let's move on. So... We've talked a little bit about what is an oyster, and we've talked a little bit about the external internal features. So what I'd like to do is shift gears a little bit and talk about why oysters are important. And we sometimes refer to that as ecosystem services. And when, when we talk about ecosystem services, we talk about why is it that an organism or a habitat is important. They can be important um, ecologically, they can be important economically, they can be important socially as well. So oysters are very important in terms of the filtration process. Um, we already established that they are, they're filter feeders. And adult oysters, I have a little um, data up here, 60 gallons a day for a subtitle oyster. So in terms of its filtering ability, if you were to imagine 60 uh, gallon jugs of milk, they're able to filter that um, in a day. And some of you have already talked about how they improve water quality, they filter the pollutants, and they control algal blooms. I mentioned earlier about pseudofeces and feces. So this is just an image of an oyster that we uh, had in, in, a, in raw seawater. So it was busy filtering raw seawater. And you can look here when it blows out that pseudo feces, that, that matrix of sediment and mucus, the stuff that the oyster doesn't want to digest. It's a little finer, it's a little smaller. And then on this side, sort of that X current cavity, um, you see the feces. So what I've got is I've got a video. Um, we did a time lapse. You see in the center there with the, the bowl of five oysters. We had, those are adult oysters, and we put a, a high concentration of tetracellumis um, in it. That's that flagellated phytoplankton, just to kind of watch it filter over time. And so what I want you to do when I click the video is look at the sides of the oyster. You're going to see some of the pseudo feces getting blown out and then some of, the, some of the feces as well. So we'll just go ahead and run that, and it's going to go from dark to light, obviously, because that oyster, those oysters are filtering that water. So that was just kind of a demonstration of how they're able to take what's in the water and filter that out. Um, in terms of time, that took about that took about a two-hour time lapse um, video. But again, it all depends upon well how quickly they can filter the water. What are the sediment loads? What's the concentration of algal cells in the water? How many oysters are in a given spot at any given time? So oysters are also indicator organisms. And what we mean by that is you could take the tissue of, it, of an oyster and you can analyze it. And scientists have been doing this for, for a long time. They, they analyze it, say, for instance, for trace elements. They might be interested in looking at, well, what does the oyster concentrate in its tissue, like arsenic, copper, selenium, 
Um, are there pollutants in that tissue? So an oyster, when we discuss it as an indicator organism, it really tells a story about the water quality that's around it. And so that's really important. Um, in, in Chatham County, there's one area that, that we can look or we can harvest recreationally oysters. And that's because it's Oyster Creek out by Tybee Island. And that's because Department of Natural Resources monitors that water. And so we can be assured that those oysters are not, they don't contain um, contaminants. So an indicator organism. Shoreline stabilization. Um, when we look at this image, you can see this is our, 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 um, our bluff out behind the aquarium. You see that bulkhead, which is a man-made structure. That's considered an armored, um, an armored buff, riparian buffer, as opposed to the Spartina grasses and the oysters that you see in front of that, that bulkhead. And there's um, a lot of projects going on currently on the coast of Georgia looking at living shorelines. So what I mean by that is that we're using native plants like Spartina grasses and we're using oysters to kind of develop a riparian buffer to protect the shoreline from erosion. Because if we didn't have those Spartina grasses and we didn't have those oysters, when we get boat wakes or storm surge, or flooding, um, that, that erosion occurs at a much faster rate. So it's, it's um, really important to have sort of that, that riparian buffer. And, and of course, we're going to the more, um, the, the method of living shoreline of using those native grasses and using oysters to help protect the shorelines. We've got a list of, of organisms on the right. You see southern flounder all the way down to the blue crab. And I listed these organisms because these organisms utilize an oyster reef um, at some point in their life cycle. They may be transients, like a lot of these fish that you see in this video. Um, they may move in at high tide, forage, use the reef in whatever they need to do, and then at low tide, move out. But then there's some transients or some organisms that tend to live um, in, in the oyster reef all the time. So oysters are a safe refuge. They're a habitat for a host of many organisms, very important organisms, whether they be recreational fisheries or commercial um, fisheries um, as well. All right. So other things, food source. And I mentioned that people do like to eat oysters. Um, Georgia at one time was, uh, had a, a, a rigorous commercial fisheries. Because they're intertidal, the fisheries here along the coast of Georgia was very labor intensive. You'd have to hand, go in and hand pick them. And um, it was really popular in the early 1900s, but by, by World War II, sort of the interest um, de declined over time. But you can see here just an image that, that Georgia is popular to do oyster roasts. And so a lot of the oysters that we get here um, are, are, are native oysters, but then a lot of people get oysters from other places as well. South the Carolinas, the Gulf. Um, but it's an important food source, not just for organisms that live on and around the oyster reef, but for people as well. So let's shift gears into sort of the decline of oyster populations. And I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I do want to mention that these are, are some of the, the reasons why there is a decline of, there has been a decline of oyster populations. There's generally not one, one particular reason. It's usually in combination. So the, the most common one, of course, is habitat loss. Um, pollution is, is a big one. Overharvesting uh, is, a, is a good one too, um, up Chesapeake Bay. All of these apply to Chesapeake Bay as well, um, but overharvesting, and that's what's so important about abiding by fishing regulations. Disease is another common one. There's MSX and derma, which affect the respiration and the, and the um, digestive system of oysters. Sea level change, as, as sea level rises, if oysters aren't be able to, to keep up with the sea level rise, of course, they will eventually get inundated. The shell so shortage, um, we remove oyster shell, but we need to put that oyster shell back because that's a substrate for juvenile oysters to settle, attach, and grow. And then, of course, ocean acidification, we talked about that oyster having that calcium carbonate 
shell. So any uh, lowering of the pH causes havoc on, on a, an organism that creates a calcium carbonate shell. So I want to just briefly mention, I, I want to mention that if, if you don't know already, um, Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant had the very first oyster hatchery on the coast of Georgia. Uh, we started it back in 2015. And oyster hatcheries are, are very important. So they're all up and down the coast and along the, the Gulf, of course. But the oyster hatchery plays a, a very important role. And some of these um, roles involve restoration. We started the, the Georgia project back in the early 2000s. It, it was the very first oyster restoration program on the coast of Georgia, where we actually put the shell material back into the environment. Um, Marine Extension and Department of Natural Resources currently work together to, to do that. Um, research, we need to understand um, more about oysters and, and impacts and, and how pollution affects them. So research plays a very important role as well. And then finally, as I mentioned, we have the very first oyster hatchery on the coast of Georgia, aquaculture. Okay, instead of taking wild populations, we're able to culture uh, oysters put them out into the rivers as, as seed and then um, sell them eventually in the commercial market. So oyster hatcheries play a very, very important role. So I'm gonna kind of end that. Um, what I may do is take a few a couple of questions before we transition from why oysters are important so I've got some live animals that, that I'd like to share with you. Um, so what I'd like to do now is um, Kayla, if you want to go ahead and um, share the the, um, the the pipefish video, I've got a video of, of, of pipefish that we fed um, brine shrimp, and pipefish do utilize the oyster reef. Of course, they're going to be subtitled, so they'll move into that oyster reef. Um, I'm going to go ahead and play the video. But they'll utilize the oyster reef, and you can see them kind of picking off the brine shrimp that we fed. Um, pipefish are related to seahorses, and if you look at their tail, they're long and slender. If you look at their tail, very different from a seahorse. A seahorse has that prehensile tail that it's able to kind of wrap itself around things, um, but, a, but a pipefish um, doesn't. So that's just one example of an organism that lives on and around the reef. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to go ahead and switch to another webcam that shows some of the live organisms. And I'm going to get Kayla to switch that out. Very good. So, ooh, this is cool. They're feeding. So we set up some barnacles this morning. And barnacles um, are actually, they're actually crustaceans, they, they look a lot like an oyster because of those calcium carbonate plates, but we fed them brine shrimp. And if you watch while I'm talking, I want you to kind of watch. I don't want to disturb them too much, but you'll see those valves. There's one in the center. Oh, cool. Okay. So there's one in the center. Those valves are opening up their, their calcium carbonate plates. And you may say, well, that really looks like a, a bivalve but it's actually what makes it a crustacean is those cirri, those feeding appendages that they're releasing. They're, they're basically trying to filter the water of plankton. And you can see the, the pink, <laughs> the larger brine shrimp that are floating in the water. Oh, there's another one opening up to the left. So barnacles, um, very much like oysters, need a hard substrate in order to subtle attach and grow. So they're, they're sessile. They, they begin their life as part of the plankton, similar to what oysters do, but as they, they metamorphose, they, they settle, attach, and grow. So if you own a boat, you know all about barnacles. Um, you can find them on dock pilings. You can even find them attached to, to oysters and other barnacles. That's cool. All right, that's awesome. All right, so what I'd like to do is point out a couple. I'm gonna move some bowls around and there's some, there's some different species of organisms, again, that are indicative of, of the oyster reef. Most of these will move 
Well, they'll move in and out. I'm going to I'm going to kind of pull this aside. One of these organisms, this is these are actually grass shrimp. And of course, they need to stay submerged. So they'll be subtitled. But grass shrimp are very common. Oh, you can see some little smaller crabs moving around. But those grass shrimp, OK, they have small claw like appendages. And what they do is they just kind of pick off small pieces of detritus. Um, off the oyster or organ, other small organisms. There's also, I'm going to point this organism. I'm going to move this one over because I think this is a really cool animal. Kayla, does anybody know what this one is? This is, this is a really cool animal. Do we get we'll it? Just a, a few seconds. Oh, we did have a couple people say spider crab. Spider crab or decorator crab, very good. This is a, a perfect example of a crawling crab. And we call it crawling, crawling crab because look at how it's adapted, those pointy appendages. And when we look at the, it doesn't like that, does it? When we look at those crawling legs or those appendages, if they're pointy, that's indicative of a crawling crab, as opposed to a portunid or a swimming crab, like a blue crab, that last paddle that a blue crab has to make it a very efficient swimmer. But you'll notice we, we call them a spider crab or a decorator crab. Check this out. Look at that or those orange structures on top. Anybody know what those are? They're actually animals, believe it or not. Does anybody know the name of that animal? It looks like a plant, but it's an animal. Um, several people have said sponges. Sponges. And coral. Okay, great. Yep, that's a red beard sponge. And I've picked off some pieces here. Um, that's a red beard sponge right there. But the decorator crab will use it to protect itself. It basically it, it attaches red beard sponge or higher bryozoans, hydrozoans. And that's one defense mechanism, not to mention that it's brown, a lot like the color of an oyster, but that's one defense mechanism. And I'm going to very quickly pull apart that crab, which is very cool. This is a porcelain crab. This is an invasive species, very common commonly found on oyster reefs. You notice that it's flat, Oop, and there it goes. You notice that it's flat, both its claws and its bodies are flat. Believe it or not, it's a planktivore. It eats plankton, it has special appendages, and it has little cilia that it sets up currents, okay? And the flatness allows it to hide in and amongst the, the oyster reef. And I'm gonna quickly, cause we're kinda unfortunately starting to run out of time, show you a couple of fish species. And so again, there are, there are fish that will move in and out. Of course, a lot of them need to, to be subtitled. So the, the fish will move in and out. They're more the, the transients, but this is one that's very common. This, um, I'm gonna try to move it over here. This fish is an oyster toadfish. And if you look at an oyster, oyster toadfish, it's colored just like um, the oyster reef. So it's, it's modeled, that's one defense mechanism. It has a very powerful jaw. Um, we sometimes refer to it as an ambush predator. Oh, look at its fin swimmer, that's pretty cool. We refer to it as an ambush predator because it kind of lies in wait, just like it's doing right now. And then when something swims by, it'll, it'll, um, it'll, attack it'll it'll take it it'll it'll bite it eat it um but it's a it's a perfect example of a benthic or bottom dwelling fish there's another one that i'm going to try to flip this oyster shell over it's hiding okay this is actually a blenny and there are two species of blenny um, that we find here on the on oyster reefs there's a feather blenny and then there's a striped blenny. Both of these are striped blennies. You see the coloration, um, one's darker than the other. That's just different um, coloration. But blennies, just like an oyster toadfish, are kind of that ambush predator type of organism. Modeled, its coloration helps you know, protect it from predation. There are fish species like uh, weak fish and other types of, of fish that move in that'll, that'll feed on it as well. Those are, they, they would be um, major predators. Well, that's cool. So we've got both the oyster toadfish and the blend. All right, well, Kayla, I think what we can do is if, if there are any questions, um, because I know we're running a little bit 
out of time here. There's never enough time, is there? Um, but maybe we could field a few questions. If you've got questions, I'm gonna switch the, the camera back to, um, back to me. But if there's any questions about, well, any of the live organisms or any of the, the things that we've talked about, we've got a few minutes, we can do that. Sure, so um, I did miss ask one of the questions from before when we were talking about the spray. Um, they were actually wondering, not in the dissection, but when you're looking at an oyster bed, the spray that you see come up. And someone else asked a kind of similar question. As tides fall and expose oysters, they appear to be spitting fluid. What is going on there? Okay, okay so they, they're, they're, they're spitting fluid. So that's just a function of, they know, let me get another shell here. They know that the tide is going out. And so what they're gonna do is that adductor muscle is gonna kick in. It's gonna, it's gonna close that shell because if the oyster is open, then they're more likely to dry up and desiccate because of course they're exposed, they've got the UV, they got the sunlight beating down on them, drying them out. And so perhaps what you're seeing is when that oyster closes, it's expelling some of the water that's in that cavity. Okay, because again, when they're subtitled, they're gonna be filtering when the water's covering. So within that cavity, within this shell, um, there's gonna be a lot of excess water. It's like when you pick up a whelk and you touch the foot of the whelk and it closes up that operculum or trap door, closes up, it's protected against desiccation, water gets spewed out of the, of the cavity as well. And hopefully that answered it. Awesome, thanks, Danny. Um, someone else is asking how long do oysters live and how old is a three inch height oyster? Ooh, those are all good questions. So um, three inch oyster, well, let's, let's backtrack. How long can they live? Um, there are estimates that they can live up to up to 20 years, which to me is blows my mind because um, it's an invertebrate and it can, it can live that long. Um, Three inches, how old is it? Well, that really depends upon where the oyster is from. So Chesapeake Bay, the, the, the general rule is that it can grow an inch per year. And at three inches, it's a legal size oyster. So three inches, three years. Georgia, however, because we have a much longer growing season, water temperatures are much, much warmer. It takes about 18 months as opposed to three years up north to be legal size. So it really depends upon where, where you are. Um, it depends upon the food source. It depends upon sedimentation. So a lot of other factors are gonna, environmental factors gonna play a role in how quickly that oyster matures and how fast it grows. Thanks, Dodie. Mm -hmm. um, we had a couple questions related to um, their role in uh, being filters. Um, one general question was kind of where do pollutants go once the oysters filter them? And then someone else specifically was wondering, because they are filter feeders, are scientists finding marine microplastics or fibers in the stomachs of oysters? Okay, that, those are both two really good questions. So I'll, I'll start with the, the trace elements, sort of the pollutants. So when, when scientists analyze the, the tissue, the, the meat, okay, and what they'll do is they'll, they'll go ahead and extract that meat um, from the oyster and they'll analyze it. And they're able to analyze it for, you know, again, um, elements like arsenic, copper, selenium. So the oyster concentrates the, the pollutants or the trace, the excess elements in their tissues, whether it be in the gills, um, in the mantle. So usually what they'll do is they'll extract all the tissue and then analyze that. Um, as far as the microplastics, that's a really good question because, you know, in assuming that oysters are filter feeders, you would think that they would ingest some of the, the microplastics, the small pieces of plastic. Um, there have been lab studies that have shown that they will um, ingest some of micro beads. These are small beads that were intentionally put into the water so they can ingest them. But in terms of um, natural populations, they're, they're finding that oysters are able to ingest a lot of those microplastics. So instead of getting assimilated into the tissue, like into the stomach, um, they're actually able to digest it and 
push it out their their cavity through feces. So there's still a lot to be learned. We, we, we're learning a lot about microplastics. Um, there's still a lot to be learned in terms of how they impact filter feeding organisms like, like oysters. Um, I think it is starting to get close to lunchtime. So some folks had some food related oyster questions. Um, one is any theories on how people figured out oysters were edible? And is there a taste difference between intertidal and subtidal oysters? Uh, well, I mean, oysters go back to Native Americans. I mean, that was their food source. You see a lot of the, the, the evidence of that in our shell mins up here and down the coast. Um, if you've ever spent time on the Chesapeake Bay, uh, historically, Native Americans, you know, always ate, ate, ate oysters, and it's just something that, that has, you know, been shared after generation after generation. Um, in terms of taste, um, I don't know that there's a difference between, I don't, I don't really eat oysters. I love oysters. I think they're cool animals, but I don't eat them. Um, well, sometimes I do. Not raw. Uh, but anyway, the difference between subtitle and intertitle, I don't know that you would get much of a difference. I think what you would get a difference is in different salinity regimes. So if oysters, they pretty much want to be in adult oysters, 14 to 28 parts per thousand. So ocean water is 35. So it's kind of in that brackish range, 14 to, to 28 parts per thousand. So maybe if you tasted oysters at lower salinity regimes, it would taste different than at higher salinity regimes. These are good questions. Do we have any more? Um, we did, we're, we're running a little short on time. We had a few okay. more. One was, how many oysters do you harvest every year? Do I personally harvest every year? Zero. <laughs> no, actually, I, I do it more for education. We're, we're actually going to be taking our fellows out in a couple of weeks to teach them how to to um, to harvest oysters responsibly. We're going to go to Oyster Creek with fishing licenses and we're going to teach them how to do that. But I'm not much of an oyster eater, so I don't really harvest them. I, I like to, to use them for teaching. That's about it. So, yeah. Well, Kayla, before we go, I just want to thanks everybody for joining us today. I had fun. I hope you learned something um, from us today, and 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 hopefully you guys will be back for some other oyster programs. We'd like to do one on the on the hatchery uh, in the future, so hopefully um, you'll join us for that. But I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead, Kayla, and turn it over to you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jody, um, and a big thank you to our uh, friends of the aquarium that helped make. Uh, our programming possible today. Um, we appreciate you. And there are, you can either become a friend or get involved with us in a number of different ways. This hour uh, counts towards the Coastal Stewards Program, um, which is a series of workshops and classes designed to engage adults in becoming more aware of and engaged in coastal conservation in Georgia. Um, our next one is going to be in January uh, 28th on bird-friendly native landscapes um, with Karen Giovingo. And then um, February 11th is going to be Diamondback Terrapin Conservation. Um, if you have young people in your life, we do have some events for them as well. So those ones I just talked about are mostly for adults. Um, but on January 30th, we're going to have a day in the life of a marine geologist um, with a college student, Erica Ganey, talking about some of the cool research that she's done on various vessels um, and field work. And then March 20th and 21st, save the date for our Youth Ocean Conservation Summit. And then lastly, if you are someone who is involved in doing water-based tourism, so whether that's paddle outfitting or charter boats, um, we have a coastal awareness and responsible ecotourism uh, training that's specifically for, for those industry professionals. Um, and you can contact us to learn more about that. Um, and then for any homeowners or people that have small businesses, we are gonna have a program starting up in March about the coastal uh, rain garden program. And so there are incentives and information and resources to build a rain garden um, at your site. And we will send a Qualtrics evaluation, a program evaluation right after this. So if you have feedback on what you liked from today's program, uh, what you might want different or topics for future coastal stewards, uh, we really do value and appreciate that feedback. 
Um, but we hope you have a great rest of the afternoon um, and we'll see you hopefully later in January.